Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining. We have Tim Span from Cloudera here today. Uh, before we get started, just a few quick announcement. So DataCon LA is uh, scheduled. We are uh, hosting it this year again virtually, um, just because I mean, I think it's better we keep it virtual, at least for this year. Uh, but it's going to be on September 17th, 18th and 19th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, mid-September. So um, please take a look at the DataCon LA website. Um, you know, you can find more information on there. Uh, and also one more thing on the DataCon LA website, we just refreshed it. It's a brand new website. If you have any uh, feedback, you know, please feel free to email us at website at dataconla.com. Uh, with that, I want to introduce Tim. Um, Tim is an engineer with the with Cloudera, and today he's going to spend time talking to us about real-time streaming pipelines with Flank. Tim, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. And yeah, definitely uh, sign up for DataCon LA. I put in a talk there. Hopefully it gets accepted. That seems like a pretty cool event. Uh, I am from the East Coast, if you can tell from the accent. Fortunately, I didn't have to uh, drive to LA, though I wouldn't mind being there right now. You probably have better weather than we have uh, over here in Princeton. So we'll see. <laughs> I got some links to my things. You'll get these slides. And a lot of this is just uh, reference. I don't want to go through the slides for too long, but these are good takeaways so that uh, when the demo and running through uh, the real live code is done, you know, you could have uh, some things to look at. I'm going to cover what I call the flank stack. It's really three projects that work really well together in Apache. And I put together the names of them to make flank, which sounded cool to me. I don't know if anyone else thinks it's cool, but that, that's what I'm using. And we'll cover some of the basics of it. It does, I mean, these three projects do a lot of different things and they're pretty straightforward. And I'll show you how we, for this use case, I'm just doing uh, stock data and I show it from three different stock uh, sites that provide data, show you how easy it is to acquire, manipulate, edit this data, then get it into a form where you could do different analytics on it whether that's analytics in stream or when they land, all those are available with using these uh, three projects together. Uh, mostly focused, I think data engineers will be get the most use out of this. It can be used by data scientists and programmers for other things, especially if you're doing uh, complex event processing. But anyone who needs to take some data, manipulate it, get it moving somewhere, whether that's in a small project on your own computer or even on a Raspberry Pi or a little Jetson Nano, or it's on a, a small cluster that's on premise or in any of the clouds, all the same uh, projects work in any of those, whether you're running it you know, in a simple uh, VM or in Docker or in Kubernetes or on top of uh, Yarn and Hadoop. They all work together pretty well and it's pretty simple. I like cats and I wanted to make the slides not too boring. So there, there may be some interesting pictures as we go through. They're not relevant to the technology, but uh, they, I seem to fit uh, well. So today's data is pretty simple. I have a couple different rest points to get the data and one from WebSockets. It's all JSON, but some of it's a little, uh, a little complex. So we're going to convert it, maybe change some of the names and see how we could process the stock data. So while we're going through this, we're gonna get uh, show you, get you up to speed in streaming. What's nice is when you look at what we're doing in a codeless environment or low code, depending on your opinion on what we're writing here, it's hard to tell if it's streaming or if it's not streaming based on when the data comes in and your own opinions, but we'll, uh, we'll show you that as the things are running. Click too fast. So we get in the data. NIFI is really the first part of the flank stack. That is my Swiss army knife. This is, I wanna get data. What's the easiest way to get started? NIFI can pretty much get any kind of data. 
So it's a good opportunity to use that to try to grab the data. If it works and it's fast enough, then we're, you know, we could be done then. Now, if I can push it to my data store and we might be done with their application. Often though, I wanna do more. I want maybe streaming SQL on that to do some continuous analytics. I wanna share this with other applications, maybe front end apps, maybe dashboards. So then we might put in Kafka there as a good place where I could buffer my data, maybe run some apps in there. I could run a Kafka Connect app maybe to do some additional uh, processing, maybe push that to a data store or maybe a Kafka Streams to do some microservices. Or what we're doing as part of the Flank stack, as soon as it's in that Kafka buffer, each event that comes in is going to be pulled off with some uh, Flink SQL and a continuous uh, query where I could do a number of different things with it, whether it's things like joins, bringing together data, you know, converting it, doing some functions on it, or just acting as a very simple pass through, or maybe I query it and send it to another data store, which could be Kafka or for people who have some front end apps or dashboards or things like Jupyter Notebooks, I could push it out to a REST endpoint or make it available as a materialized view with a REST interface. So I could just tap into that live event data without having to have, you know, some Kafka reader. Some of these tools aren't really great for consuming Kafka, especially if you're running some kind of analytics, like I said, a Jupyter Notebook or Zeppelin, where I might just want the data as it looks right now, use it in some kind of ML or some uh, data experimentation or exploration and use it what's there and without having to access some database or without having to install something like Kafka, which might have that dissonance of, I'm running something now that's really I don't want to wait for events to come in and then consume them one at a time. I really like to see what do you, what's the most recent data, use that for my call, maybe do some changes and do that again. This makes for a nice way to feed, you know, a constant set of uh, refresh data to those kind of uh, ML expiration apps. And we, like I mentioned, NIFI is that first piece and there's a reason why. It's all graphical. It scales really well. I could run it on my laptop or I could run it in a hundred node cluster. It's really designed for grabbing all these kind of crazy different data sources, hundreds of them, doing some routing on them, doing some transformation and then sending them on their way, whether it's a final data store, multiple data stores, or in today's use case, I'm pushing that to Kafka so the events can be processed in something with a little more power like Flink. What's nice here is while that data is in stream, I have the ability to analyze it. If it's something that looks like a record or a table, I could treat it as such. So things like comma separated values, XML, Avro, JSON, Parquet, I can read those on the fly and then convert it to another type without having to do any code. This is nice if I wanted to, sometimes I'll take that JSON, put it into Avro. So it's a little more compact and has a, a schema attached to it. So I know what that data is and it's really ready to be queried or put into a table. What's nice is right within NiFi, while that data is streaming in, I could do live updates to the fields in those records and events as they come through, whether it's one record at a time or micro batches of hundreds or thousands of them. And I could do things like augment the data by adding additional fields. For me, the uh, some of this REST data for stocks doesn't have a unique ID, uh, doesn't have the timestamp of when it was processed doesn't even, for some of the calls, doesn't even have the symbol of the stock, which, you know, I might want to grab lots of different uh, stock quotes from different companies. I want to put that in there. So I augment the data with a simple, uh, one simple step. Again, if, if this looks like code to you, that's about as close as we get to code, where here I'm changing uh, the format of a field to make it look like 
a timestamp that I like. I can also validate data as it's coming in. Often rest data could come in broken. Maybe not all the events, maybe some, maybe a field will be missing. Maybe sometimes they'll give me an extra field. And uh, maybe sometimes I'm concerned about type. Maybe sometimes I'm not. So with the one step, I could validate that. That comes in handy a lot. Sometimes I might wanna do lookups against that data. Again, this comes in handy if say you're running servers that have uh, a REST endpoint to do uh, some kind of enrichment, like maybe a machine learning model, maybe just something like Apache Tika's REST server where it can do some uh, NLP or analytics for you or conversions. I can easily set that up as one of the steps in the flow. Makes it pretty easy. NiFi right now is in version 113.2, which is uh, some major leap forward. I've been working with it for like five years and it was just turned 1.0 then. Now we're on 1.13. The enhancements they have to work well with Kubernetes to be able to do load balancing between each step, handling things like data drift, being able to sample records as they come in, to be able to make uh, very reusable data flows. So if data comes in, even if it's sometimes XML, sometimes JSON, I can make it generic enough that it'll look at the data or you'll send in a hint or some metadata to say, hey, now I'm sending XML, handle that as if it's XML, then convert it to JSON. And you don't have to worry about having multiple copies of a flow to handle those kind of pipelines. And it, it makes it very easy to genericize it and change this on the fly. You don't have to recompile. I don't have to redeploy. It could literally react to different event data coming in with no changes for you. So that's a pretty cool feature of NiFi. I touched on Kafka. I kind of like Kafka. I visited the Kafka Museum. Obviously there's two different Kafkas. Both of them are uh, very interesting. Not really related, but uh, for the Kafka we're using, we got these events coming in. What's nice when you use something like Kafka, once I've got it into Kafka and you have a proper cluster set up, you're not concerned about losing events, not concerned about, you know, now that I'm disconnected from the person who published them, who's gonna consume them now? That's not really your concern, but it's also very easy to monitor that those are available for consumption and multiple different apps or users can consume that data as it arrives event at a time in a, a very straightforward manner, very fast, very scalable system, really works out as the, the key pipeline in the whole system for Flank. And that's the K in the Flank. But uh, sometimes that's not enough for your applications. I wanna be able to do things like continuous SQL or continuous uh, ELT or ETL as the data is coming in, being able to do complex event processing, being able to do things like fraud analytics as these events come in. So as soon as something happens, say a trade happens, I get that stock in, I can react to it immediately. I'm not waiting for something to happen on the minute or the hour or the second. This is not a micro batch. Flink takes things continuously as they happen. It is a really great way to do this processing and the scale for Flink is incredible. It's used by Alibaba and some really large companies out there to process huge amounts of data on you know hundreds, even thousands of nodes. I'm running on one node and it's doing good enough for me, but having that ability you know to write your SQL and it works, and then when it's time to scale out, you're not concerned that what you wrote is an application that can only be used in small use cases. You know, you don't have to worry about extra, you know, changes or writing a new kind of application to uh, scale out as big as you might want to go. And the, the SQL is ANSI SQL. So you don't have to learn some kind of weird syntax or some kind of lesser version of SQL. It's got all the things you'd expect to have in there with where clauses and order by and group by, all those sort of joins, everything that you need to do some advanced applications. I'll show you a couple that I have running 
and uh, run some new ones. Uh, there's a couple of things that are very specific to running in a streaming environment. And that's things like uh, this hop end that's looking at data in windows of data, which could come in handy as opposed to just looking at the data as it comes in event at a time. I may, for here, I'm looking at intervals of 30 seconds. Maybe I could do a minute, five minutes, depending on you know what you wanna have relevant. So maybe I wanna look at the max uh, value in that five minute window. And maybe that's something I send somewhere. This might be, I'm looking for alerts. This is where I might be looking for anomalous data or for stocks, if it hits a certain value within that five minutes, let me jump on that highest one and start, you know, selling or buying more, whatever you want to do there. I have a couple events coming up, but we'll leave these slides with you. Let's look at real code. I think that's nice. Hopefully nothing timed out in my uh, cloud here. So I am very busy with my environments. You probably shouldn't have this many applications running on one NiFi cluster when all of them at once. But uh, I like to be able to run into different demos, especially if someone has questions and says, well, could you work with this type of data or what would happen here? What's nice with NiFi is everything is available for you to see, unless you're in a you know corporate environment and someone locked it all down and you're not the admin. We have all of our flows running in here and the environment has all the data that you need to know about what's going on, what started, what stopped, you know, what data is moving around, all of those things, pretty nice. So if uh, something seems to be stuck somewhere, very easy to check. And one of the things that I really like and a lot of the DevOps people like is behind the scenes for this UI, I know not everyone wants to program with a UI, this is all REST calls. So if you want to do any kind of operations or even building apps in a non-GUI manner, you could do that through REST calls or use our command line interface. I don't want to ever have to go to the command line except for doing my DevOps that builds the environment, but you know it is something that people do. So I have a couple of different stock flows running here. And I'll show you in NiFi how we do these things. What you're seeing now is part of the NiFi flow to grab stocks from uh, WebSockets. This is from FinHub that gives you a nice uh, feed of transactions for stocks. And it's pretty straightforward. I connect over uh, WebSocket SSL to a server from FinHub. Uh, this is what we call a controller here. All these things are running until I stop it. So when uh, WebSocket events come in, I'm doing uh, checking them and then I'm sending some data back if it's uh, connected. So WebSocket's supposed to keep running forever, but often they'll time out or they'll ask you to reconnect. So this flow over here is designed to get that connected message, route it to some code that says, you know, reconnect me, resubscribe me to this stock and this other stock, and I send that message to WebSockets. I could save that data, but that's really just administrative data to connect to the WebSockets. The more interesting thing here is I get those events in from WebSockets. I want to process them. They send me a ping. I don't really care about that. That's just to keep the uh, WebSocket connection alive. I throw that away. I parse the WebSocket message, change some of the names of the fields because the field names are pretty horrible. Uh, they have like uh, names like uh, the letter uh, the letter P, the letter S. I guess to save save that traffic to make it as fast as possible, especially if you say you subscribe to ten thousand different stocks. You know, they're, they're saving some bandwidth here by having the name of their fields with a single letter. I don't really want to have single letter fields in my data. I mean, maybe that's fine for you, but there's no way I'm going to remember what that is. So I, I change it and then I push it to Kafka. What's nice is in NiFi, nowhere in here am I telling you what that data looks like. 
All I'm telling you is it's JSON data and I have a schema for it. And then I'm just gonna write it as JSON. I could decide to write it as something else. Here, I'm gonna stop the data live and decide, well, let me see if I could do a different writer and I could pick, you know, maybe I wanna write it out as XML or I wanna send it as parquet files, which I can drop on uh, S3 and immediately start querying with uh, Spark SQL or something else, or send it to, uh, I could freeform build text. Maybe if I wanted to build something like uh, a text form or report, I could do that. And I'm just gonna send it to this topic. And I have uh, my client ID, so I know who it is. So when I'm trying to debug that, I could find out what's going on. What's nice in NiFi here is I stopped live code. There's no consequence there. I have a configurable queue between each step. So those objects will just back up while I'm running. Not much running here. Unfortunately, the market is closed. So there hasn't been too much aftermarket trading for this particular one, which is the uh, penalty of using WebSockets on stock market data after hours. So a little more interesting here is I have one that's pulling from a REST endpoint. This is from uh, the IEX data cloud. They give uh, pretty good market data. It's a little bit delayed, but for demos or for your own purposes, it's pretty easy. What I did there is start it to run. What you'll notice here is things can be started and stopped with no penalty. Pretty easy to do. Another thing I think that's important when you're doing data pipelines is to know what's happening with the data. What's unique with NiFi is we have something called data provenance, or this is a lineage of the data as it's coming through the system at every step. So I can see within this lineage when data arrived, you know, how big it was, uh, gave me a unique idea on it. What component am I processing this with right now? with its unique ID. They also put the name there because I can, this gets pushed to different systems for processing this metadata, this provenance data. I can run within NiFi a SQL query against this provenance metadata. So I can search and say, well, show me all the data about uh, this component, which I can put a unique name on if I wanted to make it easier. So I didn't have to try to go for all those split JSONs or you know, all of them based on a component ID. And we get all this metadata, which can come in handy if you wanna, again, parse the data, split the data based on different things, like uh, what was the URL it came from? You know, what was the size or just what was the data? So I had a bunch of JSON data come through here. I'm splitting it based on what it looks like. And then I'm just sending uh, the data to a couple of different topics, which I dynamically pick by looking at the data. Uh, IEX gives you three different types of data within one REST call, which if you've had to deal with that, it's kind of a pain, but pretty easy for NiFi. I just routed them out to separate processors, process them separately and pass along a parameter that says, what type of data is that? So I've got that map to a schema that describes the data and to keep things easy to track, I keep that schema and topic name the same. So when I put that data out there, there's no mistaking what it is. It makes it easy for me. It also lets me have one processor dynamically work on that. And I'm using a parameter here. So I can parameterize any of these things. You're like, Tim, you hard coded something over here. I can make this into a parameter and then that is isolated from the actual code. So if I want to write a generic flow and then deploy it somewhere else, I could dynamically apply parameters either through the UI, through the command line tool or through REST. Makes it easy when you're doing DevOps between environments to isolate those parameters and they are encrypted for ones that need to be encrypted. So if there's a field somewhere that's supposed to be a password or something that uh, needs to be secure, that will be encrypted. So uh, someone can't take it. It does mean you'll have to 
reset that. If you see here, I stopped this part of the flow on the fly while we were working on it. And you could see there's a number of pieces of data that are paused there in this queue. They are not lost. So when I restart things, they'll just start processing. Again, very important when you don't know what you're gonna do next in a flow or you have an environment that's maybe not stable. You know, I wanna to push to my database, but sometimes it's offline. Sometimes the network's a little iffy. Sometimes things fail. I'll show you different ways we handle that. But here is I get all this data waiting in the queue with all its metadata just waiting for me. What's nice is we've got pretty powerful queuing and I can name each one of these. Again, if I wanna be able to monitor one particular flow, one particular piece of it, I can do that either through the data we push out to things like Datadog or Grafana or to any system you want in the format of JSON or whatever format you want that we support. Or I could push that into NiFi, which can run a SQL query against those events. Again, it's as powerful as you need it to be. What's nice is not just do I have a queue here that allows automatic back pressure. If something stops, it'll just back pressure its way out until each of these queues is full. And I can manually set the size here. You know, how many objects or events do you want in there? How big do you want this queue? And this can also be, we can enable, we have a interface that lets you pick either a mathematical algorithm or a machine learning algorithm or write your own that will dynamically resize that so you don't have to set some fixed value. Uh, that, that's set in the configuration when you're starting your server or your cluster, but I can also manually change it for each queue if I wanted to. Like if I needed this to be 90,000 or something, I could do that. We could also have this load balance for you between each step. So say you have specific code that has to be processed by one node, everything goes in order, everything I want distributed based on a particular attribute within the data or metadata, I can do that. I can compress data as it's traveling between different nodes, potentially in a large cluster. I could also prioritize that some of the data, and if I do it by attribute, I can make it, you know, decide, okay, if this attribute is here, say it's an alert while I'm processing regular data, that one goes ahead of everybody else. Again, nice features if you need them. And we'll just let this guy continue processing. He sent his data to Kafka. What's nice for debugging purposes, I could see it all here. I could see what happened to it where that data went. I could even track the whole flow of where it came from, what happened, how it did that. Or I could check that if I push that to Apache Atlas. I mentioned sometimes things fail and we know that in NiFi. We don't like to just push it to a log or just get some exception or just die. If something fails, I always wanna handle that in NiFi. And that's something unique with every processor regardless of if I wrote it, the open source community wrote it, or it came with the, the distribution, we've got these different relationships here and we can handle what we're gonna do based on you know, those conditions, which makes it nice. We could also do a couple things in here, like what happens if it fails? Do I wanna penalize and have it wait if there's an error before it tries again? you know, built in. Do I want to send out error or warning messages to the log or to what we call the bulletins, which you can see on the screen or again, pull in through REST or have them sent somewhere. I could also at every single step decide if I want to change when things run. Perhaps your downstream data store doesn't support having five servers hit you continuously every second. Maybe you got to put a delay in there. I do that when I push things to Slack. If I send a thousand messages a second to Slack, I will get banned. I've been banned from a, a couple of those systems where you, you're not supposed to send thousands of pieces of data in a minute. So you might have to put a delay in there and you could just add a delay or even set up a cron schedule for each step and just put in you know, what it is in cron. 
You could also decide that maybe I only want this to run on the primary node, which is elected by Zookeeper standard uh, clustering kind of thing. So if I want something to only run once, regardless of how many nodes I have, which might be important when you're say writing to a file or reading from a file, you might not want multiple things accessing at once because they might not be allowed to. Maybe you only have one FTP credential at a time allowed to a server, those sort of things, pretty straightforward. So we push data into Kafka. I could see it in the provenance, but it's still kind of uh, a mystery what's going on with that data. So here we've got a couple different schemas and I'm not really sure what those are uh, unless I took a look. Like here it says attributes modified and I know what it is. It tells me how many records I sent, just one. But I could also see those variables that you saw in with the dollar sign. Those are telling me what the uh, schema is. So I could see here, okay, there should be one in this IEX trading news. So I should be getting a bunch of new records over there. So here I can look into Kafka, take a look at those topics. It was IEX something. I think it was this one with news. I could see there's data there. I could look and see if there's stuff in the last hour. Seems like I've got some messages over there. I'll take a look. Yeah, I see things coming in. This is uh, who produced it. Again, that's why I put that name in there. So I know who's producing the data and I know who's consuming it. So it makes it easy to debug these things. And I can see a bunch of data here and it looks kind of weird. I don't remember putting weird symbols in there. And that is because the data was stored as uh, Apache Avro uh, with an attached schema that I referenced from a registry, which I'll show you in a minute. So you can see here, this I kept the same as the topic, makes it easy to reference. And then I could see the different data types in there. You know, that one's a string, there should be a Boolean. And I could see that looking at the data. Okay, that's there. It put it in a nice readable format. Again, so I could kind of track what's going on, see what's going on with that data, making sure that what I think is there is coming through. Uh, that's important for debugging. And if I look to see that schema, I could take a look, that was news. Okay, that's where it's getting the schema from. That's got a rest endpoint, makes it very easy for me to uh, connect to that data. So we, we saw that data came out. Is anybody, it said someone's consuming it. So do I have someone consuming that? I do. And it's pretty easy to consume data from NiFi. It's just uh, same thing we saw before. Here I'm pulling from that Kafka cluster and I wanna read all of those topics. What's nice is now if I can read from a bunch of different topics, I know that data is Avro, convert that to JSON, do some processing. The data is all a little different. For the news, what I wanna do is pull apart data, grab just the fields I want, and then push it to Slack as a message. Pretty straightforward, but so the good way to start pushing uh, news to Slack. And here it's talking about, uh, this was news about an earnings call from Alpha Street. And it makes an easy way to send some data here. Here's some more. It's just coming in real time as I turn this queue back on. And there was some of them built up because I turned that off because I didn't really need to push those Slack messages when no one was watching. Now, while that event data is coming in, I'm also doing a query that looks at the events for quotes on prices. If the price is higher than the uh, one year low, I wanna do one set of activities. If it's uh, less than the low, I wanna send an alert out to say, hey, the price is really low. Maybe now's the time to buy. And here I'm processing that and sending that out to Slack for you know, additional notifications on, hey, this is a, a good price. Take a look at that. And that's going to uh, another topic over here. Little simpler, but it's got uh, that different information there. What's going on? And then finally, I've got another flow that's hitting a different stock endpoint. This is 12 data. 
they have a slightly different set of stock data. My thing didn't uh, time out here. Just open a new window. Sometimes my network's a little uh, slow here. So I'll go into this one. What's nice with NiFi is I could run things even if I don't want them running continuously. If I, if I call some of these uh, stock sites too frequently, they get uh, upset. So I'm taking that data in, doing a quick query and converting it. Nothing too complex, but I'm doing those updates I mentioned, adding a couple of fields that I need. And then I'm just sending it to Kafka. I'm sending it to Kafka two ways. Because for some use cases, I want that Avro, which over here, I'm taking it and writing it to a table. What's cool here is you'll see the name of the table, but there's no field names. I don't have to worry about that. Because it's using that schema for this uh, stock here, this is all on this uh, topic. It passed along its schema name and a header. It's just going to look at the schema registry and say, these are all the fields and types. If you match that, I'm just going to write to this kudu table, which is uh, pretty easy to write data store. But that's a two-step process. Just take any streaming data and put it in a fast object store. And if you say, well, Tim, I don't have kudu. OK, you got HBase? Do you have a database, maybe? I can put it to a database. Again, no writing any SQL to do the insert or update. Uh, Mongo, maybe? You know, whatever, whatever you're doing, a ton of them there. And if I wanted to store it to 14 different things, I would just grab uh, another one and set a couple of parameters there, connect uh, the data there, and just put my uh, connectivity to that data store. And what's nice here is I know what that reader is. I'll just use the same reader I have for the other one. Put in the name, collection, you know, set up whatever... Uh, MongoDB connection that is, and just start writing there or to a database, whatever one of those you want to do. So we've got that data coming into Kafka. Again, we've seen data coming into Kafka a couple times already. Might be starting to get boring how easy it is to get into Kafka, but I have a bunch of them here that I'm going to be reading with Flink. And let me show you my Flink environment. This is a web UI on top of Flink SQL, so I don't have to go into the command line, which you can launch yourself if you want to use uh, the command line one. Uh, that is a way to run your Flink SQL. This environment uh, makes it a little easier, so I like using this one. It also has some of the parameters, which might be a pain to set up, like set up a restore point, you know, have this always restarting, those sort of things you know, make that uh, kind of a pain. So this environment is pretty cool. So I'm running a query here. If you take a look, I don't know if that's the easiest format to see. Maybe the uh, less dark, no, it's worse. Maybe light, I don't know. Hard to say which is the easiest to see here. Yes, yeah, so if, if there's different kinds of authentication, like, uh, let me show you in this one. So I have data sources here. I have a couple different Kafka clusters. I, I registered them. I did my connection. And if it was depending on what kind of format it is for me to how I'm going to connect to them, there's a couple here. There's a couple more depending on the provider. And there's different ways to connect to Kafka. What, whatever kind of permissions that you need, you could do. The same with NIFI. Yeah, I made it a little simpler by not having those. But if you need to log into something, there is always a way to do it. Anything that you could do with any other app. So if I need SSL, I put it there. If there's a username and password, I put it there. If it goes through Kerberos. If, say, I'm pushing to a database or reading from a database, those permissions are part of your setup. So say I'm going to push to, you know, Oracle. Uh, so I'll set up a connection pool to Oracle, just like you'd expect to do. And you're just going to set uh, whatever those permissions are. And if they need to be uh, something that changes, as I suspect they might be between dev, test, and production, 
I'll set this up as parameters. You know, this is my JWC connection. I'll put the parameter there. So when I move it to another environment, it will, you know, I can automatically do that. Same for any of these fields, standard stuff you'd expect to connect to JDBC. We have here, you know, where's the driver? What's the class name? What's the JDBC URL? What's the login? Is it through Kerberos? Is it through a regular database username and password? How many connections I want for my pool? We pretty much have that for everything. NiFi has been out since, it's is well over 10 years at this point. It started off as a project within the NSA to be able to access any of their data sources uh, on the fly. So that's why it's sort of interesting that I could start and stop things or change sources or sinks because you know things go down or change when you're in these kind of very operational environments. Obviously things take logins and passwords and SSL and Kerberos and, you know, I might have permissions for ADLS. I might need them for my Cumulo login, for my database. All those kind of permissions are settable. If you could set them anywhere, you could set them in NiFi. So yeah, I'm, I'm not setting those up because this is my own little cluster. I, I could show you environments where we have, you know, four levels of security I have to set for uh, Kubernetes for Knox, for Kerberos, and that's not as much a fun a demo, but all those settings are possible to do. Same with this environment. This could be behind Knox, so we have a single sign-in to the whole data platform, and you know I'm getting the data sources that an admin set up for me. All those sort of things, pretty straightforward, but uh, not something you want to have to set up in a... Uh, in a in a meetup because you know it's extra step to log in not log in but all that's available it's not uh this is not something that can't work with secure environments you know even uh government level security not a problem uh we i mentioned rest endpoints we've got what we call materialized views which are pretty cool for this one this is returning back some of that stock data and whenever I call it, I'm gonna get the current value that's coming through REST. And as you see, I'm still pushing data there. So that changes. So, you know, you could have a front end or mobile app, or like I said, Jupyter call this REST endpoint, do whatever there. What's nice is uh, this has a, a key that you can configure for it. Plus it could be SSL. So you could lock that down. You could also lock it down behind something like Apache Knox or firewalls if you want to share that materialized view. What's nice here is this environment makes it easy for me to run and deploy those apps. I'm not writing any Java or Scala. I don't have to know how to deploy an app to a uh, Flink cluster. It does it for me, keeps the management there, gives me all the relevant uh, recent logs also gives me access to the uh, Flink dashboard. This tells me everything going on with the, uh, the Flink app that it built to run that SQL. And the dashboard is pretty nice for tracking the real-time applications. Again, if I had full security, maybe I wouldn't have permissions to see every job. Maybe I wouldn't have any of these there. These can be stopped out. Generally, we use Apache Ranger to lock these down. Again, you know, depends on your environment. This job has been running for nine hours, running this query, which is pulling from this Kafka source, doing this group window aggregation. And you can see the data coming through, you know, if you need to track it, see things like uh, logs, uh, you know, whatever is going on here. We've had watermarks. So if things crash, I could continue and go back to where I was some of the nice features of uh, Flink that we take advantage of in these SQL queries and more metrics than you probably ever want to see. Certainly more than I want to see, but it's nice if something's going wrong, I can go into that and see what's happening. And I've got three jobs running right now. I've only got, if I showed you how small my cluster was, it's a one node cluster. 
that's running all of this, including the database, uh, we're still getting a lot done there. So that's all the things going on here. And what you get here is a, a nice window where I can run my SQL queries, pretty straightforward. Uh, it gives it a name. You can name it yourself. It has a nice uh, random naming in there, which is sometimes gets some pretty funny names. And within there, I can write in whatever query I want. It also gives me a sample of the data here. So I'm sure that the, the data returns back what I want. I could also, if I like this query, I could turn it into a materialized view. It'll pick for me what it thinks the primary key is. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. And then I could pick some other values there, some settings, apply it, and then create my own queries or have it just be like the one I showed you where there's just an endpoint and I don't have a query, but you could pass along a query to that very easily. What's nice here as well is we have a couple other things that are useful. Things like make it exactly once when I'm pushing the data down, put in a save point. So if something stops or something's removed from a cluster, when it comes back, it'll be at the same spot. So you're not uh, worrying, did I process those records or not? It'll get it for you. We can also connect to a sync where it'll automatically insert whatever the results of your query are. So if I wanted to send it to another Kafka topic, I could just pick one that I created or I could send it to a webhook. And these webhooks are pretty cool. This will just push to a rest endpoint of your choosing. And it could be post or put. I, most people do post. You could have SSL on, I don't have SSL. We also have uh, JavaScript in there. So if you wanna do some changes to the data, with some code before it gets pushed through, you could do that. You can also add some custom uh, HTTP headers if you need them. You could also completely reformat the data if you wanted to with a simple set of uh, scripting and what format you want there. Again, whatever you need to do with your uh, REST call there. And it'll push through that data pretty quickly. I've got one uh, running over here in NiFi just to show you uh, what we can do. And this is just a rest endpoint with this uh, path and this uh, port, and it's just getting all that data. So far I've sent 41,000 messages. I'm not doing anything with them. I haven't thought of what I wanted to do with them since I already saved them and did some other things. Just to give show you uh, how to push to those uh, web hooks. Uh, we're getting close to time. I haven't seen any additional questions out there, but I definitely want to open the floor to anyone who has uh, anything they'd like to go over. If uh, they want to see something there different. There was a question in the chat. I don't know if you saw it. Um, you can take, if you can take a look. Well, I saw the one about uh, different kind of authentication yeah. Okay. Yeah, for different data providers. And yeah. clearly some data providers will have Kerberos, some will have a username and password. Yeah, NiFi, Kafka, and Flink all support that because you know they're used in production. It it'd be nice if no one had a password, but then we'd all be hacked every second. So yeah, we support all of that SSL and whatever you need to support is, is in there. NiFi also lets you encrypt data on the fly if you need to. Uh, another question: uh, visualization. Uh, depends where I want to visualize. Now, I do have a couple of open source ones here uh, for really simple visualization. Remember, I pushed that data to Kudu. I could just do a query here and it's got some visualizers there. Remember, I said I could push data to REST. So since I can push it to REST, I could have a Jupyter notebook read that. I could have a Zeppelin notebook read that. There's a lot of commercial products out there. I've been using uh, this one here is Cloudera Visual Apps because I get that free, of course, my uh, network timed out here. Because security, right? You, you wanted security, wow. <laughs> Sometimes you got time out here. So I'm using this visual app is nice and this will make rest calls out. Uh, it's There's not many live visualization tools that work with streaming. 
as events are happening. Now the visual app, I can make that rest call and get that rest data, but that's kind of not as it happens. The only one that's uh, open source that'll do that is pretty cool is called Superset. And that sits on top of Druid. Now, if I push something to a Kafka topic, Druid has the ability to get those events. It'll be a consumer and get those events as they happen. And then Superset will show it as those events are live. That is an open source option. Uh, the Cloudera data visualization will have that pretty soon. Right now, it just takes uh, data from some pretty uh, standard places, you know, Druid, Hive, Impala, some data stores, you know. But we're going to add Flink SQL to that. So you'll be able to have live dashboards of uh, that data as it's coming in. Of course, you could write something with a REST endpoint that gets pushed or consumes those uh, either materialized view or that web hook. That's an option. You can also do uh, Kafka consumption from the front end. There is uh, a Kafka consumer for uh, Node.js and for Python. So you could definitely do some front ends there. It really depends. Most people aren't really ready for live data. To me, this is the, the best way to do that because you know, as events happen, keep pushing them there. That's kind of the interface for this kind of data. I do have a very, I don't have it running, but I'll show you uh, what I've done is, like REST doesn't really make sense for live data, but WebSockets do. So I do have this WebSocket app uh, that I run inside a single page web app that just gets pushed Kafka messages from WebSockets. And that's kind of a way to have a, a live interface, again, open source. I'll uh, make sure I post the, the links to that application. So if you wanted to write your own very simple page that reads, you know, gets constantly pushed WebSockets, here we're pushing uh, WebSockets to that single page app here and then it'll just show up on the page. If you're really good with JavaScript and front end apps, you can make a nice, I don't know if you wanna do a map or a live table that just keeps scrolling down as the data comes in. Depends on your, your uh, programming abilities. Yes, the put, changing the data is a nice feature. Cause especially, I mean, some of it I can do, there's two places I can change that. Let me go into one. Like here, I'm doing a sum and changing it. I can concatenate some fields. I could do some math. I could also set up a user-defined function to uh, that I can call within that SQL. So that's one way of doing it. Another way, which I think is a little slicker, is those syncs, whether it's to the rest point or it's to uh, a Kafka topic. I can always add uh, the configuration here or code that gets it as uh, JSON and could change any of the fields. And we could also do that on the source. So if I want to transform that data before, you know, before it even comes into the interface, I could do it there as well. And I can make multiple different virtual uh, tables on top of uh, the same topic if you wanted to do different processing. So you could do a lot of that right there. Now for the materialized views, I can edit that, oh, where is that? I can edit that within the materialized view. I think it's the older one, let's see. No, not there. I can edit that, uh, let me go here, edit that job, go into the materialized view, and then I can, Let's make it run longer. I could apply that configuration. I could add another query, you know, like query two. And then I can add uh, a filter here, which is coding on how I want uh, people to pass in the value from uh, the rest endpoint. So I could do some programming there. Or like I said, you could just do it within the SQL where I add uh, a custom UDF I write or uh, is People are starting to write them at some point, put in a marketplace. 
So it gives you some options without doing a ton of coding to be able to change that data before it either comes in or goes out. And then if I set up a sync here, like to go to Kafka topic, I can process it, have those UDFs, pick just the fields I want, maybe concatenate some together, add some additional functions and you know have some things in the source table that change it. And then when it comes out the other side, it's as different as you want it to be. So there's a lot of places where you can interject you know, code or changing data pretty simply, as well as within the, the SQL syntax for Flink, which uses Apache Calcite, which is really rich SQL engine. There's a lot of different functions in there to do uh, all the things you expect you could do with SQL. I think we're out of time. I don't wanna go too far, but if you have additional questions that we didn't get to, my contact information is in there and we can uh, just contact me and I'll show you a little more or I could send you uh, some more information. I'll send, you'll get the slides, you'll get this video. Uh, all of this is published to uh, GitHub. I've got it documented here with a couple of articles. And I also have a, another GitHub that has uh, a dynamic script that'll build this whole environment, build the Kafka topics for you, uh, build the NiFi, build uh, the Flink SQL, everything there for you with all the table definitions, everything in there, make it easy for you. I already found the GitHub, nice. Very cool. Uh, hopefully uh, people like this. Uh, if so, then maybe they'll let me do another talk in uh, September. If no one likes it, uh, you probably won't see me then. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll post the slides and video soon. Um, other than that, and thank you all. And I hope to see you guys in September. Our, our next, um, uh, what do you call, webinar will be on May 5th. So uh, more information on the website and on the uh, meetup page. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.